but now let me very uh, briefly introduce our speakers for today. So our first speaker will be Dr. David Lawrence, who is a research fellow in biomedicine, self and society at the University of Edinburgh, um, at least for the moment. And then um, that sounded almost quite sinister, but that's a positive thing. I'm always um, riding the line. It's okay. <laughs> great. And then we have um, Lalita Sundaram, who is a research associate at the Center for the City of Existential Risk, um, or CISA. There we go. So over to you, David. Thank you. Um, to, to, to explain that comment, I am currently at Edinburgh. I will soon be moving to Durham. Um, it's not that I've, I've offended the powers that be too much. Um, so, well, we got the title, uh, you know, Bioethics Outside the Box, and, and you know, we, we had a few conversations about maybe what would be interesting to talk about, what people might want to hear. I was thinking about the fact that ethics or, or ethical expertise, if you like, is more and more popular or it's more and more sought after, you know, in the in the news media. And then I thought, well, how does that reflect on or how does that um, come into the world of being a scientist or being a, you know, a scientist in training, if you like? Um, I know not everyone in the in the room perhaps fits that description. But, and, and maybe what I'm going to say is, is broadly aimed at those who it would fit. But I, um, I think it's probably something that is worth always bearing in mind, whatever side of the aisle you fall on, whether you are, you know, a, a so-called ethical expert, like I like to pretend I am, or, you know, a, a, a practicing scientist or an aspiring scientist or whatever it is that you do. And I think that when you try to think about doing your active research in the sciences or commenting on that active research, there's, there's two things to consider from an ethics standpoint. You know, there's the ethical practice of your research, but there's also the wider societal context of that research. And here's your outside the box part, doing your work within the, uh, doing the ethical practice of your research is kind of inside the box bioethics in a way. And the wider context perhaps is the outside the box. You know, what it will produce, what implications, what other effects that might have. And I, I won't really talk about the, the, um, the, the, the actual practice of research, you know, the first one of those. If you're here, you're probably very, very well aware of the need to conduct your work ethically. And there will, of course, be all the many ethics approval processes that you have to navigate um, along the road to even getting something in the lab. And that's all great. That's all really important. And learning how to navigate that is very important. And it's a kind of constant process throughout your careers. But you're thinking, you know, you're thinking about the piece of research, you're thinking about the process you're using, you're thinking about the treatment of your research participants, wherever it is. And that's, that's sort of it. More interesting, I think, is in many ways, is the second one, that wider context. And to talk about that, I want to tell you a little bit or give you a few thoughts that I have on how to think through making ethical judgments about science in that broad context. And then I want to talk about a, a sort of real world example that for me really sort of drew that out into uh, sharp relief, that societal aspect. So when I, I was saying before that there's more and more and more demand for public debate over whether something's ethical. You know, we have this insane news cycle now. Any tiny news story about science or technological progress, whatever it is, gets pulled to pieces by pundits not all of whom are, let's say, offering expertise. It's a lot of the time they're offering an opinion, which is not necessarily the same thing. So for something to be ethical expertise, it, it must have um, at least the ability to, or someone for someone to offer that expertise. Let's say they might need the ability to create um, and analyze and present all the evidence and the arguments that you might need to defend or um, you know, weaken a proposition of ethical significance. Proposition of ethical significance being so where you would see a claim that, um, you know, some conduct, some proposal, some policy is, is right or wrong, good or bad, wicked, virtuous, anything else, you know, claims that something can cause benefit or harms to, uh, to persons or to their rights or their interests. 
the kind of ethical statement that you see in a newspaper headline calling a new technology, you know, unnatural or wrong. Um, things that could just be, you know, knee-jerk reactions, opinions that aren't necessarily fully considered. Um, they don't necessarily account for all the facts. And it's really, really easy to be swayed by that. It's also really, really easy to be swayed by that when you're in the business of thinking about ethics, when you're in the business of thinking about the implications of your own scientific work, your own scientific practice. You can let them color your own judgment quite easily, I think. And, and But that is very dangerous when you're thinking about the effects your own work might have. Um, you know, when we claim some of us to be ethical experts or be offering ethical expertise and you're contributing to say public policy, you, you have to do it in a way that doesn't violate a principle of ethical neutrality. So something I said would have to be accessible to reason, it would have to be you know, non-partisan. It can't just appeal to someone who's already on site. So I am very kind of open to the use of various biotechnologies. Um, there's, there's no point in me just sort of preaching to the choir. At the same time, there's not a great deal of value to someone offering a judgment that is, um, you know, just designed to please those who are, let's say, highly bioconservative, those whose uh, views on a, on a matter are, you know, really heavily informed by, let's say, religious belief or cultural practice or whatever. If all you're doing is kind of feeding those viewpoints, that's not really contributing in a way that helps anybody. This is not to say that any of these viewpoints are completely invalid. It's just to say that you're not doing anything. You're not moving the conversation on. You're not, you know, hugely contributing. And I am extremely guilty of playing to the crowd a lot of the time. We all are. But what you need to be looking for is for your ethical judgments to be able to appeal in principle, if not, you know, in practice, to everyone in a society, you know, regardless of all those you know, cultural beliefs, whatever, um, personal preferences. It needs to be something that can be supported by a combination of evidence and argument. Um, and if it can't, then it doesn't have a real role to play in a moral conversation or a conversation around you know, the governance of technology. And they also fundamentally, these ethical judgments need to be honest. They need to be honest, they need to be open. There is a moral duty if you are offering these judgments or if you are making these judgments about your own science or the science of others, there is a moral duty for you to be honest and open about it. And you know, if you are in the sciences or if you work closely with the sciences, luckily you're going to be steeped in you know, the scientific method. Making a mistake is fine. Mistakes are how progress are made. Um, if you acknowledge those mistakes and you adjust for them. All kinds of judgments that we might make, you know, moral judgments or scientific judgments, anything, they can be revised in the face of new evidence um, or in new ways of interpreting old evidence. Um, there's quite a good story about the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, who uh, he asked a student something like, why did people think that the sun went around the earth rather than the earth was rotating? And this student came back and said, well, I suppose it looked as though the sun was moving around the earth, which probably it did. And Wittgenstein says back, well, yes, but what would it have looked like if it had looked as though the earth was rotating? That one took me a while to get my head around, but the, the upshot is, it would have looked the same, whoever was right, without the full evidence about the situation. And in this respect, you know, morality, moral judgments, that's the science of the good and ethics, doing ethics, making ethical judgments is the study of that science. Your morality can be a science in the way that, or bioethics can be a science in the way that, you know, biology is a science. Even history can be a science in that way. It can be conducted well, it can be conducted badly. You can use, you know, established methodologies. You can form hypotheses. You can collect and use appropriate evidence. Um, there are things that we consider to be truths and facts, but generally they can be revised when we get new evidence or new arguments. And that's just the empirical method. And this sort of brings me to the case of Charlie Gard. Some of you might remember this case from sort of 2016, 2017. 
Charlie was a, a baby who couldn't, he couldn't see, he couldn't hear, couldn't move, couldn't make a sound. Really sad story, but I, I think it's a really important one for people to be aware of because of what it illustrates um, with regard to what I've been saying. When he was about one month old, he stopped being able to move. Um, he deteriorated, deteriorated really quickly. He had an um, extremely rare heritable condition called, um, and I've written this down because I can't remember the words, infantile onset encephalomyopathic mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome, mangled that. Um, the consensus of kind of medical opinion and legal opinion is always, has been that that condition is incurable and irreversible and that by the time Charlie was seen by any doctors, he had severe brain damage, you know, at the age of a month old. And it's, it's, a, heart, it's a heart rending story, it's incredibly tragic. And if like me, for example, you, you are in support of the autonomy of the individual, then you would have sympathy with the desire, at least of Charlie's parents, um, who wanted to take him to the States for an experimental therapy or trial for an experimental, th experimental therapy, because they were convinced that would help him. So they had been told that that would help him. Um, within English law, if nowhere else, the presumption is always that the parents will act in the best interests of the child. And only when that seems to not be the case anymore, um, do the courts sort of get involved. They, they have this duty to intervene and to decide for themselves what is objectively in the child's best interests so far as you can ever know that. Um, in this case, the courts faced this you know, impasse between what the medical team at Great Ormond Street you know, treating Charlie thought was in Charlie's best interest and the different approach of his parents, the understandable approach of his parents. The courts had to then you know, adjudicate the highly opposed ideas about what the good was for Charlie Gard. And this went through, over the course of a year, this went through three, I think, different independent courts, um, you know, considering all the evidence, all of whom basically came with the same judgment. Ultimately, this went to the Supreme Court, um, where it was decided that the Great Ormond Street team were correct, and that Charlie should not be subjected to further treatment. He should be allowed, in his own best interests, to die with dignity, the terminology that they used. Um, the basis of those decisions was that Charlie had irre irreversible brain damage. There was no evidence that any treatments existed that could do anything to reverse that brain damage. And that to subject him to further treatments was just going to cause him uncertain but probable distress, was the phrase. Um, you know, more suffering, more pain to no purpose. There was no possibility of ameliorating this condition. And doing that was not in his best interest, they said. So they agreed with Great Ormond Street that it was um, time to withdraw treatment. And the case really, really hit the media around about, I think, the second court, uh, the second court appearance. You got Pope Francis weighing in, you got Donald Trump weighing in, and they were both making quite misleading interventions. You know, their high profile adds a sort of legitimacy to what they were saying, at least to some people, um, to the ethical propositions that they were making, these opinions they were offering. Um, Pope Francis, for example, made a claim that on the surface of it seems quite reasonable. He says that life support should be provided until Charlie should happen to die of natural causes. But once you think about that a little bit, it doesn't hang together. It's problematic because whilst he's on life support, he can't die naturally, or it's very difficult for him to die naturally plus the fact that life support of its very nature is unnatural. If you waited for that to happen, you would never have a, re a resolution. And obviously Pope Francis was talking with the, you know, the very best of intentions, but that gets in the way of some of the realities. Bringing this back to the scientists, there was also a letter to Great Ormond Street from a number of doctors. Uh, in this particular case, Mostly they were affiliated with the, um, the, the Vatican's Children's Hospital. There was also some American doctors um, signed this letter. And this letter promised to present new information, new evidence, new scientific techniques that the court hadn't considered. Um, 
and because these are these are active scientists they're at respectable institutions they are doing good work they're not these were not charlatans these are well published well respected scientists um that makes this letter sound you know legitimate makes it sound like there is something there and when that is presented through this this ongoing this loud media conversation that we have about the ethics of science now that gives a certain image to the public but if you read the court transcripts which of course you know nobody does there's only one of the seven pieces of research that was presented in this letter was even from was was even new it was from that year it was from earlier that year and all of that research had been had been presented to the courts and had been considered by the courts um this is not what the public narrative would have you believe there was further stuff in the letter that was just unpublished work that was never been corroborated um material that was about mice and about a slightly different problem in mice a pro the solution whether that whether that the solution it offered would have translated to humans was really neither here nor there because it wasn't for the illness that charlie had and even in the mice, there was no evidence that it reversed brain damage. So again, you needed to read all the court transcripts to kind of be aware of this. Even the, the, the original doctor who promised the treatment to the parents in the very first place, admitted that he had never seen Charlie's scans. He'd never seen, you know, the full kind of medical report on Charlie. And when he did, he said, no, treatment would be futile. So the vast majority of interventions, like this letter from the scientists, the pledges of support from, you know, the Pope, the president of the USA, and, you know, the crowds of people who demonstrated outside Great Ormond Street and other hospitals in London, it was, it was done with positive intent and honest intent. They thought they were doing or, or advocating for the right thing, you know, the right thing for society, the right thing for Charlie. But actually what they were doing was harmful to the ethical debate and it was harmful to the picture of the science. It was getting in the way of the truth in the, in the eyes of the public, I think. And more to the point, when I mean, you have to imagine the torture that Charlie's parents are going through when, you know, their actions at some points in the case seemed extreme, but you have to remember that they were being offered hope by scientists, these scientists from all over the world, top scientists, respected scientists, who are promoting techniques and treatments that surely they, you know, they were rightly proud of having developed. Um, as, you know, technical achievements, but it's also the case that those techniques were not relevant. And some of those scientists were spurred on to offer this false hope because the kind of public ethical debate over this case was so murky, so muddy. The real facts were not clear. If parents are clutching at straws and because of these false hopes, offered because the scientists were not taking the time to find all the evidence, you know, their the parents' suffering was drawn out over a whole year. And, you know, that's to say nothing of Charlie and whatever extra suffering he might have been subject to. So this is all a very long way of saying, I'm coming to the, coming to the end now, very long way of saying that there's a really broad context, there's a broad world in which your work as a scientist might live. You know, you don't always know how what you're doing will be taken. You don't know what the view of the public will be. And even if that view of the public is relevant or if it even matters, you can't know specifically who you're going to affect. None of those scientists intentionally caused harm here. They were promoting research that they thought was relevant, they thought was appropriate, but they did not have possession of the full facts of Charlie's condition. So their ability to ethically evaluate the broad picture, the outside the box bit, was lacking, right? So all I'm advocating for is that, you know, young scientists, people going into science now, don't make that same mistake. You know, everything that you learn about, everything you know about the scientific method, that holds true for thinking ethically about your work. People who go into, I might venture, maybe I'm reaching here to say, if you're going into science, perhaps you're going into it thinking in some way that, you know, you might improve the world an amount. You might do some good. 
But that good extends beyond the bounds of the laboratory. You know, it can affect societies and it can affect individuals that you never thought about. So just spare them a thought, I think, is my message. I think that'll do. I've talked for way too long, sorry. That was, um, that was great, thank you. Um, I might just uh, jump in here with a question if that's okay, because it's quite cool. a specific one to what you were just talking about. Um, but when you were speaking, one thing I was thinking about is, I feel like in the past like 18 months or so, something I, I've observed personally in the pandemic is that scientists who are expert in one area, say they are a professor of physics, um, might kind of publicly comment on an issue often relating to, to COVID or the government policy on it. Um, and then their expertise in that other area, say their professorship in physics, is then kind of used publicly to almost like legitimize. I'm not sure that's quite the right word, but kind of grant authority to their comments in other areas. Mm. And I wonder if you had any kind of thoughts on that, because I can see that relating to some of what um, you were just speaking about. Absolutely. No, absolutely. It does. And it's something that's been endemic within COVID. And I have mixed feelings about it because I'm, I'm not wanting to suggest to say, you know, people should stay in their lane or anything like that, because there's there is more than enough evidence to say that actually the insights from other fields, other area of expertise, areas of expertise have, you know, historically given us so much more or gotten around, you know, blockages in one discipline over and over. People should be able to offer their view. The problem is when those views, they can't, they're not, when they're not fact-checked, when they're not, you know, compared against the views of someone who is an expert in epidemiology or whatever it is, whoever it might be that someone's pronouncing upon. Experts make mistakes all the time, they make mistakes about their fields. Maybe everything I've said here is wrong, but you know, if I was making a pronouncement on something about global health, I would prefer that there was a global health person there to check what I'm saying, to make sure that I'm not making a pronouncement that is going to, you know, cause some harm. And I realize that the media landscape doesn't allow for that. I've done plenty, you know, I've done my share of media and you get at best 30 seconds to make your point. Um, and then that is then further distilled into a soundbite. So some of these, or many of these scientists who appear to be making pronouncements on things probably are giving a very qualified opinion, or very qualified you know, viewpoint, but all of the qualification gets taken out. I think it's less the people making pronouncements in some cases that's the problem, and more the way in which we are consuming it or in which it is presented to us. This was a big problem, particularly at the start of the pandemic. Um, you know, there was a, and I'm, you know, not to bash my own discipline, but I was unimpressed because there were so many people coming out and making, you know, giving really hot takes that were lukewarm at best. You know, poor information, not having the full facts of the thing, people suddenly being, you know, global health epidemiology experts when that was not their field at all. And, you know, just invoking problems or, or, or suggesting problems that were really not particularly relevant or reviving problems that had been long since put to bed and which we know the answers to. So, you know, the experts are as, absolutely as guilty as anyone else, I think. But maybe it's the way that we are presented some of this information that causes some of that problem. That was um, a really interesting answer. Thank you, David. It was a bit off. I think I went a bit off topic at the end. If I could just jump in with a couple of things that <clears throat> struck me. Um, I'll introduce myself in a second when we get to my bit of the talk. But um, I think what we all need to get better at is understanding the tension that comes from the uncertainty surrounding research and governing at the same time as researching uncertainty. We're not very good at that, experts or otherwise. And policy policymakers aren't good at that either. If you just think about, we are following the science as though the science tells us to do one thing. Um, experts disagree, and there is legitimate disagreement between experts. Um, 
And a lot of the science that is done now is so hyper-specialized that a virologist will not be able to tell you about the impacts of lockdown, just as an epidemiologist will not be able to tell you about the immune effects of a vaccine. And yet, those even within that one field, they are all legitimate experts. Um, another point I did want to raise is that, especially during a crisis, a lot of that fact checking simply cannot be done because the people who are best placed to do that fact checking are doing the research. They're a little busy right now, you know, they're doing the, the policy setting. And so it is this funny vacuum where everybody desperately wants to be told, well, this is what's going to get us out of this situation. We want that certainty, but that certainty just isn't available, especially during a crisis. And we saw it at the beginning of the pandemic, but we saw it, we're seeing it again now when you have, you know, a prominent um, statistician saying that, oh, in my opinion, COVID was a lab leak. Like that I've put some, I've put some numbers on it. That man has never been to a, a laboratory that works on COVID. Um, and even if he's done all the reading in the world about it, he still doesn't really know. And moreover, he doesn't, he hasn't thought about the implications of him making that statement what it does to, for example, the practice of pathogen research, the practice of pathogen research in arguably one of the countries where we need it to be done the most in China. And it's all very well for someone to very confidently say, this is what I think is the case. And I, I best, on to the best of my knowledge, everybody is allowed an opinion on these things, but they far too frequently discount the implications of that. So that was my little two cents on that question. That was great. Um, thank you, um, Lolita. Um, would you like to go into your talk now? And then we can come to the other questions um, at the end. But I see we do have a few in the chat coming in, which is great. I'm sure. I mean, I guess I'll, I may as well do my talk quick. I think it's, I think it won't be that long. Um, so yeah, so thank you very much for having me here. Um, I thought I'd give a little bit of background about myself. I am Lita. I am a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Cambridge at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. So that's quite a mouthful. Um, but the center's mission is to study, understand, and mitigate existential risks, risks that could lead to human extinction or civilizational collapse. Sometimes they're also called catastrophic risks, or specifically for the subset that I study, global biological catastrophic risks. So the fact that we're doing this over Zoom rather than in person kind of speaks for itself in terms of what a global catastrophic biological risk might be and what its impacts might be. But actually less than pandemics, what I research more is in the realm of engineering biology and biosecurity, um, the ways in which the physical practice of biology might play out over the next 5, 10, 15, 50 years. Um, and I think I have understand correctly that a lot of you who are on this call are practicing biologists or hope to be once you're done with your degree. So I hope this will be relevant to you, even if you're not doctors. You know, my talk is very much geared to someone in the lab, not necessarily with any sort of medical training or medical aspirations. And when I make this kind of introduction, especially to an audience that is partially or entirely made up of biologists, I'm always keen to say right up top, I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist myself. My PhD was in pretty traditional lab-based parasitology. And I was in the lab as recently as last summer when I was um, volunteering for the national COVID response, doing more PCRs than I have ever done in the rest of my life. Um, after my PhD though, is when I started to become interested in the subject of this discussion that we're going to have. I started to get involved in synthetic biology quite directly, in particular on a project that was aiming to develop a biosensor that would detect arsenic in well water. So essentially we were trying to genetically engineer a bacterium to produce different colored outputs based on the concentration of arsenic in a given water sample. And we were developing it for use in Nepal and Bangladesh, where the issue of arsenic in drinking water is a huge, huge health problem. And what we realized during this project was there are several dimensions to doing biology or biotechnology or synthetic biology to doing them well that go far beyond the successful experiment in the lab. So we were trying to prototype a GM product in the lab, but we were doing so with the objective of it being used in communities outside the lab. 
And that's the same for a lot of synthetic biology or biotechnology, whether it's about creating biosensors like what I was doing or industrial biotechnology, um, new pharma. We need to think about issues like, how is this thing going to behave as an object out in the world, an object that is used by people within social, environmental, cultural ways of being. So essentially what that experience taught me was to think about biology and the products of biology as socio-technical objects. I say all this because when it comes to thinking about ethics in science or the governance of science, of being responsible science, it's often assumed that this is something that comes from without, that it's something externally imposed on the scientific community, whether through regulation or ethics boards or anything of that kind. But that experience of working on the biosensor really made it clear to me that for a synthetic biology project to be successful, not commercially necessarily, but it, for it to do some good in the world, that it, to do some good in the world effectively, that governance needs to come from within. And so the work that I did there and the work that I continue to do focuses on developing that understanding of the interdependencies that um, come between the different aspects of biotechnologies and the broader social technological context, because those contexts will tend to frame them, to shape them, and also be shaped by them. So in the next few minutes, I'll give you a flavor of some of the ways that this has been done in the past and is being done now. So to begin with a historical example, so most of you will know that obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but the most important shift in modern biotechnology came in the late 60s and 70s, when the ability to sequence DNA and to use restriction enzymes to rearrange and modify these sequences brought about the debates surrounding recombinant DNA for the first time. So this was begun in large part by um, a set of Nobel Prize winning experiments that were done in the lab of Paul Berg, who was then at Stanford, a biochemist at Stanford. And so what they did in that lab was to use restriction enzymes to covalently join DNA to form recombinant DNAs. This is all, you know, genetics 101 type stuff. Oh no, genetics 101 is mendelins and peas, but genetics, the next step. Um, <laughs> so the first of these hybrid constructs that they made consisted of the very well-studied virus SV40, simian virus 40, and they joined that with a plasmid containing the galactose operon from E. coli and some genes from lambda phage. So this in and of itself obviously changed the game for genetics, but for the purposes of this talk, what's more interesting to me is the next experiment, which wasn't actually ever done, but it was planned. So that proposed experiment was the idea that this novel construct, so remember this is a construct that contains simian virus 40, E. coli bits, and bits from phage, that this construct might be able to be propagated in E. coli. So if we were doing this person, I'd ask for a show of hands, but knowing that SV40 is an oncogenic virus and that E. coli is a bacterium that is known to be present in the human intestinal tract, what might some of these implications might be from this proposed experiment? Yeah, you don't necessarily want a virus that potentially causes cancer in a simian, so in a very close relative to humans, potentially being propagatable in a bacterium that could potentially live in your gut. So the point here is not that this proposed experiment was actually going to be dangerous. The actual risk assessment shows that the risk was very, very remote of this happening at all. But that thought experiment opened up the very potentially concerning implications. And so this, ex this proposed experiment and a flurry of similar ones was recognized that, hey, we've got something here that is different. Um, as Berg said, it was foreshadowing the creation and the cloning of recombinants containing DNA from virtually any organism on the planet. So what happened next was that Paul Berg and colleagues, several other scientists who were working in similar disciplines, wrote a letter to science where they were urging a voluntary deferment of certain types of experiment. Those that introduce non-endogenous antibacterial or toxin producing plasmids and those incorporating oncoviruses into self-replicating plasmids. So, so far so good. The postponement of the experiments was intended to allow time for a big conference to be planned where these issues could be thoroughly hashed out. And um, <clears throat> the letter to science, I mean, it was just a letter to a journal. It wasn't a regulation, it wasn't a law, 
it held no formal, no formal regulatory power. But as far as we know, the implied moratorium was widely observed, despite the fact that, you know, in Paul Berg's own words, adherence to the moratorium would entail a postponement or potentially abandonment of certain types of scientifically worthwhile experiments. So scientists recognized that they were at a very special moment in their discipline and that they needed to pause and really consider things. And so the following year, they convened the meeting to really hash out these issues, as I said, the International Conference on Recombinant DNA at Asilomar, California. You may have heard of Asilomar as being this golden, um, golden place, and um, we'll talk about that in a second. So the meeting was three and a half days of mostly technical discussion. One observer said that it was virtually indistinguishable from an ordinary scientific meeting with two sessions set aside for policy discussion. And immediately the first time I read that, I, I was taken aback. Two sessions out of three days on this transformative technology that is going to change the world. If we were doing this today, if I was setting this up, it would be a policy conference with maybe two sessions on the technical discussion, but that's not how it was in 1975. But the key aims of the meeting at the time were to set out recommendations for enough governance of the potentially risky experiments so that they could lift the moratorium. That's the aim, to lift the moratorium and for any such governance to come from within rather than from law enforcement externally. And so at the end of the conference, this, this conference was a success in achieving these two aims. They, there came out main principles of containment to do with experimental design and scales of containment from for the risk of the biological experiment as well as for the risks or all as well as for the the appropriate PPE to be worn and the conditions under which an experiment should be done. And those two outcomes from this meeting have filtered through to how we practice biology today. And so clearly it had a huge amount of impact. Um, the recommendations from the meeting, yeah, they formed the basis of the first set of guidelines um, that was adopted by the NIH, um, formed the basis of a lot of the WHO guidelines as well, and pretty much have their echoes in any sort of legal system around the world that looks at genetically modified organisms. Despite being hailed as a success at the time, and yeah, like a paragon of self-governance, how amazing it was that these scientists were able to look inwards and come up with these guidelines, it's drawn a lot of criticism, both at the time and since then. And I just wanna point out a couple of those criticisms to start thinking about when we want to look at scientific self-governance in 2021, what can we learn? How should we be doing it better? So for a start for that meeting in Asilomar, the invitations were largely extended on the basis of pre-existing personal relationships. There was no call for papers. There was no invite, invitation to submissions. So it was scientists, a knows that scientist B is working on the same sort of topic, bring them along. And that sort of propagated across the world. So there's an assumption there that I and my personal networks will cover everyone whose point of view matters, whose point of view is worth hearing. So obviously that's problematic. And this had consequences in terms of the disciplinary composition of the meeting as well. 52 molecular biologists, four lawyers, largely non-practicing, and a couple of journalists. For this kind of meeting, I think it's staggering. There was only one social scientist, and that social scientist happened to be a bioethicist, but really, but maybe, um, he was there because he's the husband of one of the molecular biologists. So the bulk of the participants came to the meeting with a definite stake in wanting to make sure that their research could go forward. Now, a few restrictions maybe, but that their research should go forward and ensuring that control was within the community. And there were no participants from public health, environmental studies. I mean, today, those would have been obvious participants, or they should be anyway. Um, so the bulk of the conference was to developing technical questions and technical solutions to biological safety and biological security, nothing about societal impacts. Um, and so it's been criticized that the scope of the conference is overly narrow. Moreover, to critical issues were explicitly excluded from the scope of the discussions. Gene therapy in humans or in other organisms and biological warfare. 
And so a lot of people have argued that the strategy used by Asilomar, maybe not on purpose, maybe this is just the way that um, they were used to operating, but that this was a strategy in order to maintain control of the science and reduce the safety concerns to just a technical problem that only scientists can fix. Then that they could preempt the regulation from outside. It's a, yeah. Um, so it's seen as a mechanism, I'm quoting here from um, another observer who was at that meeting, um, Weiner. Um, the recombinant DNA issue was defined as a technical problem to be solved by technical means, a technical fix. Larger ethical issues regarding the purposes of the research, long-term goals, including human genetic intervention and possible abuses of the research were excluded. So regardless of these shortcomings, and there are many more, that conference in the cinema in 1975 has been very, very influential, not just in how it has been interpreted, how its outcomes have been interpreted in, in national law or international law to do with biosafety and biosecurity, but in terms of framing what scientific self-governance might and indeed should look like. So since then, pretty much any technical discipline you could think of has had or, or has called for an asylumar of X. So we've had the asylumar of nanotechnology, the asylumar of climate engineering, the asylumar of artificial intelligence. And so much so that an asylumar moment has come to mean a mostly voluntary pause in research to give the scientists themselves time for self-reflection about safety and security. And again, mostly coming from within the scientific community itself. But um, I think we can do things a little better. I think we can broaden our scope a little bit and we're starting to. Um, and it's interesting because this new approach that's been gaining ground over the past, not quite 10 years, is an approach towards scientific governance that simultaneously comes from without and from within. Um, that's the concept of responsible research and innovation. And I'll, I'll just go very quickly through this. It's, um, comes from an acknowledgement that science is messy and that it needs to serve many different functions at the same time. And this is from um, the EPSRC statement on responsible research and innovation. What science and innovation need to do is to be socially desirable and to be undertaken in the public interest, but they can raise questions and dilemmas. They're often ambiguous in terms of their purposes and motivations and they're unpredictable. So how do we deal with that? Well, the recommendations are that we need to deal with that in ways that are open, inclusive, and timely. And most importantly to me, collectively. And so we need to think about who are the stakeholders for the practice of biology, the enterprise of biology. We have researchers, obviously, and for a long time, that's been the only people we've talked about. But there are funders as well, stakeholders, the public. And these are not just, there's not separate communities they flow to and from each other, and we need to take that into account too. And so what concepts of responsible research and innovation state are that what we need to do is take care of the future through collective stewardship of science and innovation in the present. And that's from a paper by Jack Stogel in 2013. And for me personally, what it boils down to is thinking about science and asking myself a few questions every time you want to do an experiment or embark on a new scientific project. And again, this comes from the BBSRC's public dialogue on synthetic biology. For every scientific project, what is the purpose? Why do you want to do it? What are you going to gain from it? What else is it going to do? How do you know you are right? Who is going to be affected and how? So I'll leave it there. I hope those are questions that can stimulate a little bit of thought next time you pick up a pipette. Um, Guess we should turn to discussion now. Thank you so much. Um, that was excellent and um, really interesting. We do have uh, one question in the chat already. Um, and so Ted Rees has asked, um, as scientists or aspiring scientists, are we better off sitting on the fence and explaining the pros and cons and the need to read all the evidence or should we express um, our learned opinions? Um, it's quite a tricky question. I, I have a, I have, I have a thought. It's a, it's a short answer, I think. And I'm, my assumption is that the question, and maybe you could clarify, uh, Ted, if I'm incorrect, but 
I'm assuming the question is is thinking about you know maybe speaking in the media or things like that. Um, and in the in that particular context, you know, you're there to to stop everyone else having to do all the reading and do all the evidence. That's that's you know that's the purpose that they get you on for. So you know you're there for your learned opinion, um, and there's no you know there's no reason that you shouldn't offer your learned opinion because your learned opinion, you are an expert in what you're an expert in. We want to talk to you because of your learned opinion. But I do think that when offering those learned opinions, they should be as qualified as possible. Um, you know, as in what you're stating, you know, perhaps ought to be offered with some backup or, you know, look, this is where this comes from. This isn't just me completely spouting. Now, as I said before, the um, vagaries of the format sometimes prevent that. But I don't think there's anything wrong with offering your learned opinion. I think it just needs to be in the right place. And actually, maybe this ties a little bit to what uh, Lita spoke on, which is that about you know the fact that they were only getting people in the room who were within their kind of personal networks. And that happens with um, science punditry in the media or, or academic punditry more broadly in the media. You only get called by the BBC if you're in their little black book. You're only in the little black book if, well, certainly in my case, someone I knew who was much more famous and you know more senior and more powerful couldn't be bothered to do an appearance one time. They said, why don't you phone, why don't you phone him? And then they never stop ringing you because they don't want to go and look for experts in this, that and the rest. So you get phone calls asking you to expound on things that you have no clue about or that you really aren't your thing. And you feel as though you're, you're sort of rammed into doing that. And the nature of academia makes you want to do that because, hey, you know, this can help me. This can help my career. This can everything else. So there's a lot of reason why you want to do it. So I get it. Um, but I think when, particularly when it's something, you know, maybe that isn't your specific top expertise, you just need to make sure that everything you say is, is qualified. And, you know, so if you're expounding on epidemiology, when you're not an epidemiologist, you might have to say that and say, look, the perspective that my expertise gives me on this is this. Um, so maybe, the, maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a happy middle ground there. <laughs> to answer your question it's not an easy question to answer but i appreciate that thanks thank you yes someone's commented it's about putting forward the the context as well as the information yeah i mean that's a, that would be a, a much more eloquent way of saying what i just rambled about it's funny because when i read your question um ted I really got stuck on the um, on the little bit that says explaining the pros and cons, mm. and it's immediately brought to mind um, an attitude that I think a lot of us as scientists have um, of being like, well, if I just explain the science and explain the science more and explain the science more, the public will be so happy with my science, and then they'll just be they'll they'll do whatever you want. We hear this about vaccines. We've heard this about GM foods. We hear this about any kind of climate. Um, debate um, information. And so <clears throat> what your comment, and especially explaining the pros and cons, is that, well, that doesn't actually necessarily work when it comes to communicating science and engaging with different communities about the science. And there's that difference between engaging and um, communicating, assuming that we have all of the relevant knowledge is um, not just a little bit arrogant, but flat out wrong in many cases. Oh, we've got a Big question coming up next. We do. Um, I might, uh, if you'd like, um, Shamila, to, to come onto the audio and talk about what you've put in the chat, like you're very welcome to. Yes, please. That would be great. If Shamila, you could. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Good. <clears throat> so thanks, thanks so much for that. Um, I have been working here in Brazil as a, what we call implementation science consultant for the Minister of Health to support, um, well, at least in part, what would look like a good, good public participation, actually social participation, not just public, but patient 
all stakeholders' participation in decision making when it comes to uh, incorporating health technologies into our sort of NHS inspired universal healthcare coverage system. Um, and we have been dealing with something that's very difficult because not only we have the partisan politics polarization over every single detail that all of the countries are going through. I mean, not all of the countries, but a lot of the countries have been going through. But we also have been dealing with this need, sorry, there's a bit of background, need um, to give people space and the authority to also have their say because as patients or as users of the universal health coverage system here in Brazil, that might be um, certain types of technologies that because of the short resources, they would like to also have a say. So like, why would we invest so much money as the Minister of Health sometimes, and currently they're investing in precision medicine, while we don't have the, the um, like anti-inflammatory or, I don't know, we don't have the medicines to have the respiratory aid now for COVID-19 in emergencies, ICU. So this has been a very difficult time for us. What we have been seeing here, because I worked with them, is that um, not only we have to look for formally published literature on the perceptions and the attitudes and the impact of these new technologies, but also to incorporate political evidence from social media and deliberations wherever they happen. But there's always an issue about the value that sometimes us, I talk as a geneticist, sometimes we have when we don't have the training on qualitative research about the value and the methodological um, soundness of qualitative evidence for health economics and outcomes research. And also, um, the, the main question is that we receive from technical officers. So who should participate and how do we recruit and how do we inform them about participation opportunities? Here in Brazil, because of our constitution demands that and the legislation demands that everyone should participate, um, we have to pr produce ways for everyone to have a say. So we always take like us, stepwise manner because first we have to run a parameterization of informational content for every type of audiences so that people understand in their own terms what it is that we're talking about just and then we go forward to having those discussions in a more horizontal way. But what I was wondering is what a good answer for these questions would look like for your scenarios, because here we have this constitutional precondition. And also we are trying to move forward from only just aggregating people's claims, perceptions and attitudes and moving forward to also having this more reflexive um, discussion when doing the deliberation or the decision making because we we are always talking about um you know you can incorporate crispr cas for ivf for a rare disease which will bring a lot of benefit for certain types of diseases like medullary endocrineoplasia type 2 but there are other types of disease that we don't have like anti-inflammatories available for you know the, the outpatient clinic. So how, how do we make those tough decisions? So just kind of a reflection while we're going through these things. Well, um, taking a leaf from uh, David's suggestion, I'm going to say straight off the bat that this is not my, I mean, that 
that set of questions sounds extremely difficult and is not my expertise um, because I think it has much more to do with public health resource allocation than um, the types of work that I'm involved in, which is about societal impacts, but not on individual patients or individual patient populations. However, I would point to a couple of, um, I mean, a study in particular that was done by um, the BBSRC in the UK. So that's the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. Um, I don't know what exactly their methods were, but they did, I think, something very similar to what you're describing, Shamila, but not in the medical context. But it was um, a public deliberation, a public dialogue, they called it, about synthetic biology um, in going from the abstract to the specific. So again, it was not medical, it wasn't talking about patients, but it was still, I think, a means of structuring a fruitful public discussion from um, really quite, really some science that people are very unlikely to understand at its, um, at its fundamental level and really bringing in some, I think, quite good levels of engagement. So that's, a, it's called the BBSRC uh, Synthetic Biology Dialogue. The science is gonna be very out of date because it was in 2010, but the methodology might be interesting for you to be able to look at. I mean, otherwise, I really honestly, I don't know how people like NICE in the UK make these kinds of evaluations, but that might also be useful to look at. I'm sorry, I can't <laughs> give you a better answer on that. I can't say that I have a huge amount to add other than that, you know, I, it sounds like essentially an impossible situation that you're having to try and drive a path through. I mean, the ideal would be to be able to have these sort of public conversations maybe about a technology, an issue. So when I was talking about Charlie Gard, maybe we should have a national conversation about withdrawal of treatment. But I think that those conversations have to be completely uh, divorced from a specific case because I mean what happened in in the the Charlie Gard case was you had this cute kid and the parents were putting out pictures of a cute kid uh in some cases those photographs were somewhat manipulated so that he looked perhaps more well than he was and then you can't have that public conversation properly because it devolved into a screaming match and death threats to people offering you know to, to nurses and doctors at Great Ormond Street. Um, so I don't know how you would do it. It's certainly not within my expertise, but it feels like it's the, what the approach you're trying to take or the approach you've discussed seem to be the desirable ones to be able to have these wide stepwise conversations. It's just, um, how do you find the room? How do you find the national will, the political will to have those conversations? when there isn't a pressing or an obvious kind of pressing need for them and that's true i think you know in all sorts of fields of science um you know we probably ought to have national conversation about um certain types of genetic research embryonic research but we we, we uh, they only get attention when there's a crisis and that's the time you can't have a wide public conversation around them so you've got an extremely difficult job to do. <laughs> so we have um, come up to one o'clock now. Um, so I think we should uh, wrap up. But I just wanted to say um, a big thank you both to our attendees for joining. Um, I hope you found it interesting and an interesting pre-lunch or lunch break um, watch. And also a massive thank you as well to um, both our speakers. Um, it was such an interesting set of talks and discussion and thank you for participating. Um, thank you for having me. Thanks, it was a pleasure. I did want to say that for anybody who wants to chat more about this or related topics, just get in touch with uh, the Student Young Fung Rush organizers and feel free to have them email me and we can have a chat. So. Yeah, absolutely, same way. That's Great. brilliant. It's a really uh, generous offer. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your, uh, your days. <laughs>